Let's welcome in our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Two star. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here as always. Wonderful to have you, Bill. Yeah. And just in case, before I forget, yeah. you have brought in uh, some uh, coconut cake. Coconut cake, which is yes. Pretending to be masked as banana sliced. <laughs> but, but you and I both know it, that it's coconut, coconut cake. cake. Yeah, right. You can tell because it has a big carrot on it. <laughs> that's on, exactly on right. Yeah. That's how you can tell coconut yeah. cake. Rob, before we go, before you introduce the the star of the group, uh, yesterday I thought was a very good day at the county commission uh, can chambers. I, can I just do the intros first? Well, I, I already kind of. <laughs> have I already lost control of the show? <laughs> yes, you have. I'm but, only 30 seconds but, mine, but what I was going to say would not take long, but go ahead. You've embarrassed me now, Rob. Go ahead and introduce <laughs> Oh, that's Maria. impossible. Stop, Bill. Also, welcome in uh, Maria Lawrence, an all-star, Maria. Good morning. Uh, go back to him. Can Bill, I go Bill back? what's on your mind today before <laughs> yeah. we introduce the guest? I was going to say we, uh, we had... I thought very good day with the uh, uh, candidate forum yesterday, but we started off uh, kind of special. Uh, normally, folks bring treats in. That's what made me think of it. With yes. you saying that, uh, but uh, Laura Graham, the uh, payroll coordinator uh, for the county, brought us in a, a box of delicious pumpkin cheesecakes and uh, little uh, individual muffins. Uh, mm -hmm. It was kind of a little bit embarrassing, Maria, because Rob thought Laura brought him in just for him, <laughs> and it was not going to share with anybody else. And fortunately, yes. Hornby, Dylan, and I were able to disabuse him of the idea yeah. that they were to be shared and not just to Rob. Yeah. Understood, understood. And you know that the treat um, uh, issue is, is known far and wide. Um, I had a call. Um, two days ago from uh, a friend who used to live in the neighborhood, one Travis Hill, yeah. who now lives in Florida. And he said, so every time you go in there, you get like <laughs> treats and stuff. And I was like, well, you know, Bill pretty much shames the guests into, into bringing them. So. Oh, hold a second. How'd this go from <laughs> Rob to Bill? <laughs> Did you see that you tried to yeah. pin this yeah. on me yeah. and Maria <laughs> comes to your defense? I deflect. Yeah, come to yeah, your defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before we go, thanks, Laura. That was very sweet of you and uh, very much appreciated. And it so. was a good show. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I was on and off yeah. like working mm -hmm. and and listening, but um, very helpful um, from a candidate perspective. Yeah. You got yeah. to... You got uh, you guys got down um, all the information that was needed. I thought they all did a very good job. Absolutely. In regards to me eating a dozen <laughs> cheesecake, <laughs> pumpkin cheesecake cupcakes, you can tell looking at me yeah. that I, I eat a ton of desserts. Yeah. When people bring in a dozen yeah. donuts <laughs> and cupcakes and brownies, I scarf them all down. You can tell just looking <laughs> yeah, at me can, yes. how much I consume <laughs> in sweets. Yeah. Well, but that, but she also <laughs> said she listens most every day. Which yeah, she moved a, yeah. here uh, three years ago yeah. from Maryland, yeah. and mm -hmm. she said that uh, by listening to the show, she was able to kind of like learn things about the mm -hmm. area and figure out some political stuff and whatever. So that was yeah. pretty cool, and we, yeah. we hope we can continue to do that for people. Absolutely. And I asked her why did she listen. She said mostly because of Maria and <laughs> yes, a little bit because stop. of Bill. Never mentioned Rob. Never mentioned me once. <laughs> but it happens. She was very kind and sweet. We appreciated yeah. her uh, baking the, the – she did them herself. Yeah. There's a dozen of yeah. them and wow. i heard they were delicious but i made the mistake of putting them in the back of the room and, and they were they gone were gone <laughs> totally gone uh let's welcome in uh, our guest here he is now known as a former delegate paul espinosa who in the past in his in studio visits has brought in some good uh, dessert <laughs> treats himself by the way we miss, the you, we miss you paul. sorry you're not here <laughs> in person you, paul, paul. <laughs> Well, good morning, Rob. Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Maria. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely feeling a little jealous there. Uh, yeah. Bill, you keep going, Bill, and I'll slip in and get me a piece of coconut cake. <laughs> and, and how can you tell it's coconut cake, Paul? Because of the carrot on top. Be, be careful. Yeah, because it looks like carrot cake. Yeah. <laughs> be, be careful, uh, Paul, because the wrath of my wife extends far and deep. <laughs> Bonnie is like the sweetest person. I can't believe you even. I don't think she's ever been wrathful as far as I know. So. Well, well, she is married to Bill. That's true, and we don't have that. Yeah, that piece. You don't yeah. know what's going on there. I'm not going to risk it. Yeah, okay. good, smart move, Paul. Smart move. So, uh, Paul, let's talk about your uh, your final day as a delegate and the transition that you're making to uh, a different position here, because you are now officially relieved of all delegate duties. Correct. Yeah, that is right. Uh, so uh, uh, I think I think each of you are aware of the untimely passing of Ken Lowe, who was a longtime member of the West Virginia Racing Commission that mm -hmm. oversees 
racing and thoroughbred uh, racing, uh, thoroughbred and greyhound racing in West Virginia. And uh, with his untimely passing, uh, a number of folks had reached out to me and asked if I might consider, uh, you know, uh, filling that vacancy once uh, once uh, the governor, um, you know, began work to uh, to appoint someone to uh, to fill that spot. And um, I was ultimately uh, contacted by the governor's office, asked if I would consider serving. And for me, it was really an easy call, uh, even though I, I would say probably the most common question I was asked, uh, you know, as my uh, legislative uh, term came uh, to a close here in, at the end of November, one of the most common questions I was asked, well, what, you know, what are you going to do next? And, and my, my quick response was, I'm going to take a little breather, I think, sure. back, you know, after serving in the legislature for 12 years. But it really wasn't a hard call, you know, when I was asked to serve on the uh, racing commission. Um, it really brings me full circle. Of course, uh, my family, our roots uh, run very deep in thoroughbred racing. Uh, my father, of course, uh, was a former jockey, uh, now still trains horses, uh, Paul Jr., he's the track announcer. My very first uh, job when I was a teenager, uh, one of my first jobs was uh, a hot walker at the track, a walking hot, so to speak, uh, where you, you walk uh, horses to cool them out. Uh, on my wife's side of the family, uh, uh, both she and uh, her parents and brothers, uh, they owned horses. Uh, her uncle owned a horse who actually brought Kathy and I together. We actually met through a horse because my father was training a horse <laughs> sorry, in, which, sorry, um, in which Kathy had part ownership. Uh, I was helping out during the summers when I was home from college, and, and Kathy would come out to visit her horse. And lo and behold, uh, we started dating, and, uh, and the rest is history there. So, again, very, uh, very uh, deep roots in the thoroughbred racing industry and uh, you know, when I was asked to consider serving on that panel, uh, first and foremost, I thought it was important to have a representative from the Eastern Panhandle. I mean, Ken had so ably represented the Eastern Panhandle interest uh, on the Racing Commission. And so uh, I, I, I happily said that, yes, I would uh, continue to serve it is, or, or that I would serve. It is a uh, part time role. It's, it's it's akin to, you know, serving on the state school board or the school building authority or you're know, one of just dozens and dozens of boards and commissions uh, in the state. And so it's it's a part time role. Of course, I'll continue my full time role at Rockwell. But this does give me an opportunity to give back to an industry that has been very, very good to our family. Well, Paul, your your wife owned the horse, but she married the stud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, and I knew Rob was going to go there, and I apologize for breaking out in laughter when you said a horse brought us together because, you know, that's going to be something you can use, but my laugh, my guffaw <laughs> will not allow you to use it in the in the intro anymore. It made, but the, the laugh was very good. <laughs> it was horse-like, right? Was. <laughs> but um, truly, Paul, uh, first off, and I said this on your social media page, um, and, uh, and I think I sent you a text too, but I'm not for sure. Um, thank you so much for your service in the legislature because, um, you have always been responsive and always, um, you know, easy to speak to, um, very eager to reach out to your constituents. And I think, um, I think the, the area has been well served by you as a delegate. So I just wanted to start with that. Well, thank you, Maria, and I did note uh, your kind comments. Uh, I tell you, it was almost like attending my own funeral. I was uh, all these wonderful comments that I was hearing from folks. But uh, it really, uh, serving in the West Virginia legislature for 12 years, I mean, it really was to honor my lifetime. And it certainly was with mixed feelings that uh, I left the House. Uh, in order to be uh, confirmed by the Senate uh, late Tuesday, it did necessitate my uh, resignation from the House. Uh, this is one of the boards and commissions, at least one, that uh, uh, does uh, preclude uh, an elected official, uh, whether it be in the in the West Virginia legislature or some other elected office, from serving on this particular board. So uh, once I was appointed on Tuesday, October 8th, uh, I did uh, you know reach out to the Senate just to confirm uh, what their plans were and they did indicate that they were going to consider my nomination uh, later Tuesday evening, actually one of the last uh, uh, orders of business for the Senate before they adjourned sine die uh, uh, as part of the special session. And so uh, 
late uh, Tuesday after we had concluded most of our work, including the uh, additional tax cut that we uh, that we enacted, uh, I did formally submit my resignation, which uh, allowed the Senate to consider my my confirmation. Paul, will there be someone appointed temporarily uh, till the end of the year in your place? I believe so. The uh, uh, the the process, as I understand it, is for the uh, executive committee of the uh, party uh, of the individual that's resigning a seat. So in this case, the Jefferson County Republic Executive Committee will be responsible for submitting three names to the governor. And then I believe the governor has 15 days in order to make an appointment. So I did see uh, through on social media uh, that uh, there, uh, the REC, the state Republican Party, actually was uh, soliciting names on behalf of the Jefferson County Republican Executive Committee, uh, folks of interest. Of course, you have to live within the district. You do have to be of the party of the individual who's vacating the office. And so I would anticipate, uh, if they haven't already, I would anticipate within the not too uh, distant future, the uh, the Jefferson County REC will submit three names and then would anticipate that the governor will uh, make an appointment uh, as required within 15 days. Paul, if we can, let's go to the commission, uh, racing commission for shortly. How many tracks do we have? And of those number of tracks, how many are race tracks or thoroughbreds and how many are for greyhounds? Sure, Bill. Uh, there are actually four tracks. Uh, there's two thoroughbred tracks and two greyhound tracks. The two thoroughbred tracks, of course, the uh, the largest track, or I guess the, the track that generates the most uh, revenue uh, through wagering and so forth, that is our own Charlestown races here in Jefferson County. You also have Mountaineer Park, which is located up in uh, Hancock County, up in the extreme uh, northern panhandle. Then two Greyhound tracks, uh, one in Wheeling, uh, the Wheeling Island Casino, and then you have Tri-State uh, Greyhound Park, which is uh, down uh, just west of, uh, of Charleston in Cross Lanes. There was a move a couple of years or so ago with the previous governor uh, to get rid of the Greyhound racing altogether in the state. Is there still a move in that in that direction, or has that kind of died? I think from the from a legislative standpoint, I think it, it kind of died down. Of course, we've got a new legislature coming in here uh, the first of the year, so it'll be interesting to see you know where those folks are. Um, I did uh, bump into somebody on Tuesday before I'd actually resigned my seat and uh, had shared that I was going to uh, be resigning my seat in order to uh, join the race commission. And then I recalled that uh, they uh, had, uh, you know, had some pretty strong feelings about uh, whether or not we should have Greyhound racing in West Virginia. So I think it's always an issue. Uh, as I understand it, uh, and, I, and I may be wrong, but it's my understanding, I think West Virginia is, one of the few, if not the only state in West Virginia that has greyhound racing uh, uh, remaining. So it's uh, they're kind of a little bit out on an island. Uh, I, frankly, Bill, I, I don't know a great deal about the, the uh, greyhound uh, racing industry. Uh, both my wife and I have attended racing on several occasions when we've been to uh, either Wheeling or Tri-State. Uh, we typically enjoy going over and having dinner and, and watching the greyhounds. So so enjoy it as a spectator, but certainly looking forward to getting out, uh, actually meeting with some of the kennel owners and uh, the uh, track operators just to kind of get a little better understanding of the industry and, and, and what their uh, thoughts are on the industry. And so um, uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do just that. Paul, according to a quick search, Alabama, Arkansas, Iowa, Texas, and West Virginia have active and allow Greyhound racing. And okay. there are four states that allow it but don't have any tracks. That would be Wisconsin, Connecticut, Kansas, and Oregon. Florida used to have a big race. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. So, hey, Paul, go ahead. I'm sorry. A quick uh, before I turn it over to Maria. Uh, Paul, what does a uh, commissioner, uh, racing commissioner do? He took my question. I'm sorry, Paul. Right, Forget about right. my Just, question. Yeah. Maria no, no, will no, ask no, that go, question. Go, go, go. You're fine. Yeah. No, it's a, fair, it's a fair question. It's a question that I've been asked uh, uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, essentially, the racing commission is responsible for the general oversight and regulation of the greyhound and thoroughbred racing industry. Uh, we are a three-person uh, panel uh, currently. We uh, do have a, I, I have a colleague, uh, Chip Erling, uh, who uh, lives in the Charleston area. Uh, he is one of the uh, three commissioners. 
And then you have uh, Tony Figaretti, who lives up in the Wheeling area. I like him. Uh, who, uh, <laughs> who's the third uh, member Great of restaurant the, up the, there, Paul. Just check that's Figaretti's. What I understand. Oh, my gosh. I've not, I've not eaten there, but uh, I'm looking forward uh, during my visit to Wheeling uh Wheeling Island there to uh, stop in and and, and uh, sample some of his sauce. I understand it's awesome. So, it is. Uh, but uh, but it's it's responsible for the general oversight. Again, we are a commission. We do have uh, I think forty eight uh, staff members, uh, if my count is correct, including an executive director. Joe Moore uh, currently serves as our executive director. I've worked very closely with Joe over the years uh, in the legislature enacting various legislation i was very pleased to work with joe on the advanced deposit wagering uh, legislation that essentially ensures that the tracks uh, do receive a share of some of the uh, remote deposit wagering that folks are engaged in if if they're wagering on racing through apps and so forth uh, it used to be that the uh, you know the the app owner received pretty much all the revenue from that Uh, the the tracks who were actually providing the the uh, the entertainment, so to speak, uh, the sport, uh, weren't receiving a share, but we did enact legislation to not only authorize advanced deposit wagering, but also to uh, make make sure that the tracks and the uh, and the, the the horsemen and kennel owners are receiving a share of those proceeds. The other legislation that I was very pleased to work with Joe on involved aftercare for for horses uh, and uh, and and dogs. Uh, uh, just to, to ensure that when their racing careers are over, that they're properly cared for. So it did create a, a revenue stream for them, uh, which uh, you know I think is obviously very very important to take care of the of the um, participants, uh, the the uh, equine and, and greyhound participants in our sport. Paul, what is the relationship financially between the casinos and the horsemen right now? When the idea of putting casinos and legalized gambling in West Virginia took hold, it was because it was promised to keep the horse racing industry healthy and uh, alive in the state. Is that arrangement still gold? Well, that's uh, still in state law. It's uh, it's required that in order to operate a, a casino in West Virginia, with the exception of the Greenbrier, that there does have to be racing, uh, either uh, you know greyhound or thoroughbred racing, um, and uh, uh, there is discussion from time to time of decoupling, if you will, uh, the racing from the uh, casino. But you know, I've certainly uh, over the years made it very clear uh, you know, that my constituents here in the Eastern Panhandle feel very, very strongly that uh, that was part of the deal. That in order to authorize uh, casino gaming at the track that uh, there needs to be uh, thoroughbred racing just because of the importance of the breeding industry and in, in, uh, the eastern panhandle as well as the horse racing. And so, uh, you know, that, that certainly, uh, you know, is what I have represented uh, to uh, my colleagues in the legislature. Uh, obviously, I'm not in a legislative role any longer, but certainly will, you know, continue to advocate for, uh, you know, ensuring that uh, the the horse uh, horse racing and the uh, and the uh, greyhound racing that they do receive, uh, you know, a share of the uh, proceeds from that, just so that we can make sure we keep those industries uh, vibrant going forward. Paul, you mentioned the health and uh, the concerns with the retirement of these animals when their racing careers are over. How about in their active status? I know a couple of years ago there were some concerns over horses that needed to be euthanized on a too frequent basis, according to many folks who were very concerned about the health of some of the horses in Charlestown uh, specifically. How much of a concern will that be during your tenure? Well, you know, I think it's essential that, uh, you know, we maintain the integrity of the sport, uh, I think any time where you have a situation where folks are actually wagering on the outcome of racing, they have to have confidence uh, that you know that the that the sport is being conducted uh, fairly and that uh, the the animals involved are being treated uh, properly. Uh, or you know, folks are not going to feel comfortable participating in that sport. So it is something to where. Um, you know, uh, I think horse racing in general, not not just here at Charlestown, but I think uh, some of the major tracks, there have been issues uh, over the years. Uh, as a result, uh, you, you have seen some federal legislation that's been enacted to, you know, uh, assist in the regulation of the sport. Right now, and this could be a whole program, but right now West Virginia is not is actually um, – uh, not uh, governed by that federal law just because of some legis- some uh, 
uh, a litigation that West Virginia is involved in. Uh, 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 Attorney General Morrissey, of course, led that effort. I think Louisiana, if I'm not mistaken, is also exempt from that uh, from that legislation right now. Just it, it's really a state's rights issue. Uh, I think, it, my, to my understanding, I think West Virginia essentially is following a lot of those guidelines, but it's just a matter of that of that uh, federal legislation currently um, is uh, there. I guess there's a stay on the implementation in West Virginia and and uh, uh, Louisiana. But in any case, uh, I think it's critical that, you know, the horses are properly cared for and that everything's on the up and up or, you know, we can't expect folks to want to uh, wager and, and otherwise participate in the sports. Paul, how healthy is the industry in West Virginia? Both thoroughbreds and and uh, greyhounds. Well, I think the again, I can't speak so much to the greyhound industry because I'm just not that knowledgeable. But as far as uh, horse racing, I can tell you that uh, the horse racing at Charlestown, I think, is experiencing many of the same challenges that you're seeing across the country. Probably one of the biggest challenges, Bill, was just the the uh, the decreased number of foals each year. There, there's a there's a uh, a uh, diminishing um, number of uh, foals uh, that ultimately are racing uh, at our tracks uh, across the country. That's uh, resulting in uh, uh, an intense competition for horses. I mean, you literally have to have horses in order to have horse races. And with uh, fewer and fewer foals, uh, you know, fold each year, it, there's just not enough horses to go around. That's one of the reasons why at Charlestown, for example, depending on the time of the year, they're racing between three or four days a week, where at one point, I think they were racing, uh, I think, seven days a week, I think, at one point when they had Sunday racing years ago. But uh, now, just because of the uh, the uh, the dearth of the number of horses out there, uh, the tracks uh, do try to coordinate their meets a little bit so that you're not having head-to-head competition and, and so that you can kind of share some of the horses. So, I know that's one of the challenges in the horse racing industry. On the Greyhound side, again, that's that's an area where I just I look forward to hearing more about it. From what I understand, I think there was actually a, uh, uh, an abundance of Greyhounds because there's really not very many tracks, as you kind of outlined, Rob. I think there's actually plenty of Greyhounds, but, again, I'm just looking forward to hearing from the stakeholders to better understand what their challenges are and seeing how the Racing Commission would, can uh, can assist in addressing those challenges. Paul, thanks so much for your time this morning. We do appreciate it very much. Well, thank you all, and enjoy your treats there. Uh, I'm, I'm really <laughs> jealous, but uh, uh, I'm glad you all have uh, – I'd hate to have you all go around hungry today. <laughs> Not going to happen. We would too, Paul. I appreciate that concern. I do. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.